The Square Ball Podcast. Hello there and welcome to the show. Dan here from The Square Ball along with Phil Hay from The Athletic as we do the Monday Club, the slightly delayed bank holiday edition of the Monday Club um, brought to you on Tuesday. Well, because we can, why not? Uh, 15% off the big three legal services from our partner, Levi Solicitors, Wills, Probate and Conveyancing. Head to levisolicitors.co.uk forward slash Monday Club or get in touch with Levi's and quote Monday Club when you speak to them. Uh, or you can get your regular 10% off your other legal services, uh, your legal fees and everything else. Legal services for you personally, for your business, levisolicitors.co.uk forward slash Monday Club. 15 minutes to digest the weekend's action, Phil Hay. Although... It feels like we've got 15 minutes here almost to to, to digest 10 months' worth of, of failings. Um, so should we start the clock and go for it off the back of, uh, of Leeds 1, Spurs 4, and a relegation to the Championship? Here we go. Just to say, um, it was your decision to do this on Tuesday, um, in case anybody thinks <laughs> I was on the bevy all day yesterday um, after Sunday's events. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of point in, in digging back over the season um, because we've done that a lot and everybody knows what's gone wrong and everybody knows what the, the failings have been. But um, Sunday was the, the perfect end to a complete shambles. Um, right from the moment you saw the team sheet, right from the moment that Harry Kane scored um, a minute into the game with, with Tottenham's first chance, it was a really, really abject surrender. Um, and th- there was zero optimism in the ground before. And I spoke to a lot of supporters before the game. And there was, with the exception of, of your mate Lee, um, there was nobody there who was saying, we're going to get out of this. Everybody was totally resigned to it. And I think you felt that in the ground. There was the effort to to try and push the game. There was the effort to try and push the players, but people knew what was coming. And, you know, as it, as it turned out, Everton and Leicester did what they needed to do. Not enough for Leicester um, in the end. Leeds didn't. Um, down with them um, with 31 points. You were never going to stay up with that. And I think most of us knew after West Ham that it was done. I think going back a little bit further than that, I said to you after the Leicester game that I thought the damage was done at that point. Um, and they've just not been good enough, anywhere near good enough to stay up this season. Nice that we led off the show on you uh, chucking me straight under the bus about not bringing the uh, the episode out yesterday. Well, it, it was it was your birthday yesterday, <laughs> yeah. so I think that's, um, there's a bit of mitigation there. Yeah, and as I mentioned last week, what did I get for my birthday? Relegated. Uh, so I just uh, just fully embraced middle age, sat in my uh, in my garden like an old man, and just stared into the void and tried my best not to think about Leeds. But here we well, are. The best. I, I was sat there thinking about why did he play a back six? Why did he play a back six then, Phil? And, and what do you make of that? It was a little bit uninspiring, wasn't it? In a game we absolutely needed to win. It was, and and it was, you know, particularly the consequences were going to be particularly high once Leeds conceded after a minute because you had a team loaded with very few players who were likely to score goals. Um, and you did feel like you were going down to the soundtrack of, you know, how many how many giraffes can you get in a phone box? How many defenders can you get in a single football lineup? Um, to, to the sound of about eight defenders in the team and Weston McKinney's long throws from from the touchline, it, it was not great. And I I do get what Allardyce is saying that the you know the depth of squad, the quality, the form of of individual players is just not there um, to to dig them out of this. But similar to you know, leaving Rodrigo on the pitch for half an hour um, at the end of the West Ham game when he was struggling to run and clearly wasn't fit. Um, you're just not going to get away with that. And and by the same token, I th- I think picking that lineup on Sunday was the wrong way to go. I think it was it was asking for trouble. It was trying to play the percentages too much. It really did seem to be desperately hoping that a team that just cannot keep clean sheets was going to keep a clean sheet. And that from a long throw from about 40 yards out, you would somehow get a flick on and a single goal that gets you the win that you need. Um, but really, it was it was desperate. Um, I felt like in the end, it was a shambles of a game plan, to be honest. Um, and I don't know about you, but I do. I did sit watching that and without pinning this to Allardyce, because it is absolutely not down to Allardyce this and trying to get a head coach to redeem a terrible season with four games to go is a, is a ludicrous strategy. Uh, but I did feel watching it that it, kind of put pay to the idea that going forward Allardyce should be head coach yeah not not feeling that personally but then again if you'd have asked me when uh, Marsh initially went would I have gone for it probably not oh, we, we did see some little signs of recovery under Allardyce didn't we but uh, it just never quite materialised into anything like momentum and, and the wind went out of it in much the same way that it did with Javi Gracia well, well let's go back to the City game at the Etihad when 
they were really, really heavily outplayed as they were always likely to be by City. Um, and they, you know, they threatened in the last few minutes to nick something from it. And there was just that, as tends to happen in football, that little burst of optimism from that and the, the feeling that perhaps something's, you know, something's going to build from here. But uh, I think if you were objective about the game, City could easily have scored five or six. And we discussed afterwards about how that would come to look with hindsight. You know, if Leeds stayed up, you'd look back at that and think, that was almost like the, the genesis for the start of the revival, but actually you look back at it and and you and you say that it was kind of symptomatic of what was to come. And yes, they could have had more out of the Newcastle game, um, but Newcastle did dominate that from um, the the Bamford penalty miss onwards. And yes, they could have had more at West Ham, but again, you know, if, if you're looking really closely at the West Ham game, you're talking about a good half hour, followed by very little after that. It's it's not been great, I think. I think when Allardyce came in, keeping them up, he was going to be lucky. You know, it was it was asking too much. And I was asked for a season review today to pick the low point of the season, and it was Bournemouth away. I think that was the day, wasn't it, where everybody, you're looking at the body language of the players, the realisation that Grassi had, had hit the wall, the, the scale of that result, you, you just knew. Do you think the crowd response was fair? Too much? Too yeah. little? Underwhelming? Overwhelming? Where do you sit on it? Well, it's... I've seen it. I've seen far worse vitriol than that over the years. Um, I think fatigue and apathy has probably played a, a part in in it not being quite as aggressive as it as it has been before. I don't know how aware people were on Sunday that Radrazani wasn't there, but if you knew that Radrazani wasn't there, then it was hard aside from the players to know exactly where to turn your frustration because Arthur has gone. You know, Angus Kinnear was in the the. Um, the director's box, but the, you know the face of the club, the 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 man at the top, Rad Rosani, was in Italy. So you know who who exactly are you shouting at? Don't get me wrong, I'm sure he was watching the game. I'm sure he would have heard some of it, but I I don't I don't know what anybody would expect after a season like this. The team have not performed. The you know the the turnover in the dugout has been ridiculous, and in the end, you're left with a squad. To be fair to Allardyce, which is just not built for anybody. You know it, it was. It went from Bielsa to Marsh, and the recruitment in the summer was done precisely for Marsh's system. You know, all of the signings were, were made on his watch. Then you have Gracia, who, you know, is is neither Bielsa nor Marsh. Then you have Allardyce, who is just himself. You know, his his style is just his own. Um, so there's no cohesion there. There's no strategy. There's there's no joined up thinking. And I do feel more and more like it's a textbook case of how to get relegated. And what about Andrea Radrazani then? Because we saw the generic statement on the the club website that was put up yeah. after full time. Um, you rewind 12 months, Andrea Radrazani was quick to attach his name to the statement that went up um, at full time after Brentford, that they wouldn't repeat the mistakes of, of last year again, which we obviously have done and, and gone one better this time. No name on it this time. No no sense that Radrazani has his hand on the tiller. What do you make of that? No, pro- properly generic. Um, in no way was that going to appease anybody. My understanding of it is that ownership level on both sides, that was the statement that was asked for, that was the statement that was was approved. Um, the, the absence of communication is incredibly poor at the moment. And it wasn't a good look last week, Radrazani in Italy, um, trying to do a deal for Sampdoria as, as Leeds were about to go down. The takeover situation is still as it was at Leeds. 49ers Enterprises would like to buy the club. They've got a price in mind, um, overall value of the club, which is sitting about £170 million at the moment. There's no deal in place. It hasn't been done. It could be done. Um, they want it to happen. Um, but it's it's a club that looks and feels rudderless. And if people feel in the dark, then they should because they are. And, you know, it, it does need communication, whether it's from Radrazani, 49ers Enterprises, somebody in authority, somebody who is supposedly in control of this should be speaking. At some, and I, I get that it's difficult when you're in the middle of a transition. I know it, it becomes harder to, to discuss things publicly. But I think you have to accept that it's a, a major sporting club with a, a very, very big fan base who deserve some form of clarity about what's what's going on and where this is going. And to say that levels of trust and faith are at a low level would be a total understatement. I mean, it's, it's crazy when you think about it, isn't it? Given that we've just dropped a division and the implications that has for revenue and for the situation with the squad recruitment we don't have a director of football it's pretty staggering isn't it that we don't actually know who's in charge who is in charge because as far as i can see it in the absence of a director of football and in the absence of an owner we've got angus Kinnear there who's been left just holding the fort 
There are there is still a recruitment team there, so you still have Craig Dean, um, who over the the years has been largely in charge of the um the lower the um younger level recruitment academy recruitment, but he's well thought of Craig Dean and and quite highly rated in the game. There are still some scouts there. There are others, um, who have departed with Victor Otto, like Gabby Ruiz, who did a lot of the the scouting across Europe. <laughs> um, Forty Nine is Enterprises, as I understand it, are you know actively discussing discussing who could be head coach, who they could look at for sporting director, director of football, however they decide to fill that void. But I think in these circumstances, you can discuss opportun- options and discuss ideas, but actually making decisions becomes very difficult um, or impossible. The same with players, you know, who stays, who goes, um, who do you sign? This all requires the clarity of knowing who is in charge and, and who ultimately is is free to take these decisions. And that is only going to be decided when it becomes evident whether there is going to be a 49ers enterprises takeover or Radrazani is going to stick stick with it, stick with his 56% and try to get the club promoted again. But I mean, if that happens, that's going to happen against the backdrop of a lot of criticism and, and a lot of scepticism. Um, and I think next season would be a huge challenge for him. I mean, we work this one against the clock. Um, you're looking at today's date. It's the 30th of, of May. Today is the first day of the new season, isn't it? If we are to do it correctly, because we, we saw the photo of um, of the Brighton board meeting when Brighton just missed out on promotion the other season. And they showed that photo that a lot of people laughed at saying today we are having a meeting and today is the first day of our promotion push. And surely we need to see some sort of response from those in charge at Leeds United. But then it does bring me back to the point of who is in charge. But, but you know, it's, it's not a joke what Brighton said there. And it's even less so this season because the World Cup has pushed the Premier League season right on to the, the very end of May. You've still got the FA Cup final to go. You've still got the Champions League final um, beyond that. Um, it's an extremely short summer. Transfer window will open in a couple of weeks' time. And Leeds have a, a huge amount to do. They, they they have a list already of who they want to keep, who they, they expect to leave. Um, but obviously, a lot of that is subject to change and will, will depend on the attitude of individual players themselves. It will depend on who, what gets offered for, for who, because Leeds will have to pull in money this summer. They will have to take money from certain players. They'll have to cash in and and, and try and raise some funds um, via sales. Uh, it's going to be incredibly busy. And yeah, I think, you, I think you're right. With Kinnear there, the, there still is a chief executive who can, can manage some of this. But when it comes to actually making decisions, I don't see how any of that happens until it's properly clear as to where the ownership situation is going. Yeah, and while people have criticised Angus Kinnear this season for whatever you might want to criticise him for, be it programme notes or anything else, is it fair to lumber all this on, onto one person? Isn't this where you need to see somebody taking responsibility for, for, for running the club? I mean, I keep circling back to the same point. I'm just I'm flabbergasted that just, there's been no, nothing said and apparently nothing done about who's in charge here. You're not flabbergasted, though, are you? It's, um, well, it's yeah. kind of... Pretty- um, and it, it's you, you tend to find that clubs generally are very good at saying X, Y and Z when things are going well. But when it comes to managing more difficult situations, tendency quite often is to retreat into the background and, and say as little as possible. But unfortunately, it, it leaves people with questions and, and no answers. And you're right, the, the management structure at Leeds is, is inadequate. It is inadequate. And I think if... 49ers enterprises take over straight away you'll see changes to the board you'll see appointments and I'm not suggesting that that will necessarily work and I'm I'm not going to paint 49ers enterprises as a guaranteed white knight who are, who are going to turn turn the club in a completely different direction but it does need a fresh start and they do want to do it and it just feels to me like Radrazani has, has reached the end of the road I don't see much road out in front of him when it comes to to Leeds and you know I say it again the fact that he seems to have been preoccupied for the past week and a half with Sampdoria when this is all going on at Ellen Road. It strikes me as incredibly odd. Where do we go from here then, Phil? Um, given that we're a couple of days on from this, what, what needs to happen now? What what do we need to see besides the obvious response from somebody in charge or somebody who has some, some responsibility at Leeds? Even if you were to push out Angus Kinnear to speak tomorrow, he, he could you could question him um, about what's gone on over the past year and, and look for answers about that but when it comes to what comes next I, I think the the starting point of any discussion would be to say well it really depends doesn't it like this 
the 49ers might have ideas in mind, but I think it's no good to anybody to be given a kind of vague or potential plan for, for what's ahead um, that's all predicated or caveated by the fact that they don't actually have control of the club at the moment. What you need is for them to take control or, I mean, and I'm not suggesting this is a, a, a good strategy, but for Radrazani to decide if he is staying that, he, that that is going to happen so that things can start to move. And then you can hopefully get some concrete information about who it is they're going to go for as head coach, how they're going to restructure the recruitment department, what they're going to do um, when it comes to recruitment of players. I think they'll look heavily at the loan market this summer because, well, for financial reasons, for one thing, but also you can get some very, very good loanees in the championship who, who make a big difference. But it's a bum fight at that level. A lot of clubs want the same sort of players. A lot of clubs want the same sort of managers. You cannot afford to get left behind. There's the full-time whistle then, Phil. Uh, all in all, a fitting end to what has been a pretty much a shambles of a season, yeah? Yes, Bennett, Bonnet. Yeah. Uh, we will be back to discuss this a bit further and see if anything has progressed, whether we've heard from anybody um, in a couple of days' time. We've got the final Phil Hay show over on the Athletic feed. Um, then we're going to take, I think we're going to take a week off just to exhale from uh, from this said binfire of a season, aren't we? Because, <laughs> uh, well, we've got the charity walk as well for the square ball. And then we'll pick things up. So we're going to be uh, over on the square ball feed and on YouTube as well um, with the Phil Hay show um, as it moves over. Um, twice weekly to see what um, what happens over the, the course of the summer. And it's going to be another busy summer, isn't it, as you were saying? It's not going to be dull, is it? But then it's never dull around here. It isn't. Well, go away and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, Phil, and we'll pick this one up um, later in the week. And hopefully we've got something to report on. Um, and we'll speak soon. Thank you very much. The Square Ball Podcast. 